If you guys have been following along for a while, you know that I've been on this journey to find the best A camera for me. And I finally found it. I bought the Canon C70. <laughs> I'm so stoked about it. And this decision may bring up a bunch of questions. Some of you may be wondering, am I selling the FX3? Is the FX3 not good enough? Why would a Sony FX3 owner buy a Canon camera, let alone a Canon cinema camera? What about the Sony FX6? How are you gonna match these cameras? There are so many questions that come up with this and I feel like on paper, this decision doesn't really make any sense, but I've given it so much thought and I have so many reasons for why myself as a Sony FX3 owner bought a Canon C70. And I have so much confidence in my choice. And today I want to walk you guys through the entire process from start to finish, from research to ultimately buying the Canon C70 and the reasons why it makes sense for me and it might make sense for you. And it's been a journey to say the least. I've been waiting a long time to finally have a camera of this caliber and I've just been through so many different smaller end prosumer cameras and it's really nice to have a professional cinema camera that I can use for everything. And if you've been following along for a while, you've probably seen some videos on my channel about each camera that I bought and why I bought them. So I'll leave links to those down below if you haven't seen them. It'll give you plenty more context in this whole conversation. So all this started back in 20. 2020 to 2021. I was working heavily with Samuel Elkins, filming his YouTube videos, editing them, and we were making a lot of run and gun docu style content. And when we first started off in October of 2020, we were using my Pocket 6K, which the rig is often massive and really fragile. There's cables and cords everywhere. You have an external SSD, V mount, you always need a monitor, and it's just big, bulky, and heavy. And for run and gun filmmaking, it's just not the best option. For traditional filmmaking and cinema and commercials, it's a fantastic camera. But for the stuff that we were doing, it just just wasn't really cutting it. Our workflow together usually involves tons of driving around, hopping out of the car, grabbing a few shots. I need to get establishing shots and shots of Sam and just details of the cameras and details of the environment and everything. And then once we get all that, hop back in the car and continue on. And we did that a couple of times with the Pocket 6K and man, was it annoying. It just got so frustrating having this massive rig and having the VNDs on it and monitor and everything. It just wasn't really ideal in that situation. And it was fine for a little bit. It was just a little clunky, but come November, a very important camera was announced, the Canon C70. And it was just a seamless transition adding the cinema camera into our workflow. And I immediately fell in love with this camera. It was everything I could ever dream of to have in a workhorse camera. At the time, I was really considering upgrading from the Pocket 6K to the C200, but I was very hesitant because of that heavy, raw codec. But with the C70, it had a fantastic 10-bit codec that was so clean, and it basically had everything else that the C200 has with better battery life, better codecs, file sizes, and a smaller size. And what's sick is that I basically had a free long-term rental with this camera. Sam basically had it from November, December 2020 to July of 20. 2021 and we use that for everything and it took a little bit to get used to but over time I ended up being able to make the best stuff I've ever made with this camera with just a battery lens and a microphone we were able to use such a small minimal kit and make incredible stuff with it some of my favorite projects we ever did were the field trip episodes like the little mini docs I'll leave links to those down below and those were primarily shot on the c70 the third episode we had a Komodo as a B camera and this camera worked extremely well for our workflow I'm primarily a solo running gun shooter so I need to have everything Thing in a small kit and I don't really have assistance to be able to help me out with lenses and media and batteries and stuff. So I needed small file sizes to not burn through media. I needed good battery life because I didn't want to carry all these batteries around and have to rely on V mounts. I want to be able to have a small kit and rely on the internal batteries. Being able to have autofocus and internal audio made life so much easier. For the field trips episodes, we had a shotgun and two labs running into the camera. And that made it so easy to have all these different sources of audio to pull from. And for everything we did, I just ran it on a 15 to 35 RF or a RF 24 to 70. And that setup was absolutely perfect for the YouTube content that we were making. This camera was an absolute workhorse and the image was phenomenal. It has that special DGO sensor that's found in the C300 Mark III. So that's a $10,000 camera, but the C 70 has the same sensor in it and it's half the price and the image is just Oh, it's so buttery and clean. And having C-Log2 paired with this incredible sensor just makes it insanely easy to get a good image. You have internal ND, so there's no color shift when you're working with filters. C-Log2 is so flat and it just holds the dynamic range so well. And over time with working with this camera, I was sold on it. I had this small, reliable, robust camera that could be built up or stripped down. We primarily ran it stripped down and because of that, I could fit everything in a backpack. When we flew to Alaska, I had an RF 2470 and the RF 100-500 in the C-70 body 
in there along with my X100V and a couple other things. And it was sick because I was able to fly with two carry-ons and have this insane cinema camera with me and not have to worry about all these bags and Pelican cases that I have to check. And with the C70, there were little to no hiccups or hurdles or really compensations with this camera. The hinge was a little flimsy because of the first round of units, but that got fixed pretty quickly at Canon Costa Mesa. But the only thing wrong with the C70 at the time was that it was $6,000 and I couldn't afford that. <laughs> so all that led me to the Sony FX3. I was pretty sick and tired of the Pocket 6K. I could care less about 6K RAW. I just wanted great image quality small build and reliable autofocus and good battery life. And all that doesn't come with the Pocket 6K. And don't get me wrong, having manual focus only in a camera is completely fine. I primarily use manual focus anyways, but autofocus is great for interviews, A-roll, and just social media stuff in general. It's a great tool to have, and it's just a nice little bonus to have in a small setup like the Sony FX3. But the hard thing for me was that I was so in love with the C70 and having a cinema body. As a cinematographer, I want to work with video tools like that, but I couldn't afford it. And at the time, all the cameras underneath that were in the hybrid market, which they were great for photo, but they weren't as reliable and robust for video. There was either compromise with battery life or exposure tools or not having the better log curves or autofocus features or settings, or it would overheat. And I wasn't really stoked on all these offerings. Sure, the R5 and R6 are great in their own right. Those cameras, I felt like I couldn't rely on for client work and build a career off of. I wanted something like the C70 and then maybe pair like an R5 or R6 with, but there wasn't really anything in that market that felt like it got close to the C70. The A7S3 was good. It didn't have internal audio and I didn't really like that K3M adapter because you kind of need a top handle for these cameras. And then the Sony FX3 came out and I was sold on it. If you want to know the reasons why I bought the camera, I'll leave a link to that video down below. And essentially the Sony FX3 was the best of both worlds for me. It had great battery life, great autofocus, an incredible image, 10-bit codecs, an XLR handle to have audio built in, cinema functions, and a video focus layout. It didn't feel like this hybrid stills camera. It finally felt like this small mirrorless camera that felt like a small cinema camera. And and even though it doesn't have internal ND, it has IBIS and you can kind of get away with all that. But the main thing for me is having something small, streamlined, compact, that was reliable, that I could build a career off of. And that was the Sony FX3. It essentially bridges the gap between the mirrorless market and the cinema market. It kind of sits somewhere in between those two tiers. And I haven't really seen a camera like that since the FX3 came out, but I could have saved up more and bought out on a C70. It just wouldn't have been as nice for personal travel and YouTube in those shoots where I need a small kit. My main plan all along was having an A and a B camera, one that I could use for either things because they both have their pros and cons and the workflows that they kind of tend to. So the FX3 is a great move because it's going to be a fantastic B YouTube travel camera, but it also held its own and crushed it for me for a year as my main A camera. So at the core of it, when you buy cameras, you need to look at your workflow and the kind of projects that you're working on currently, as well as in the future. I myself have some basic needs and requirements when it comes to gear because I have a very unique shooting style style and work that I get in. I have so many different types of genres of work that come my way. So I need something that's flexible and can adapt to commercials, social media stuff, documentary stuff, YouTube, literally everything. So I need something that could basically do it all. And I still do plenty of interviews and it's nice to have internal audio so I can have ambient sound with a shotgun microphone as well as run audio from a boom straight into camera. And I still travel for work. I want to be able to have a camera that could fit in a backpack and not have to worry about bringing extra cases and checking those. I want to be able to be nimble and mobile and have everything with me in one bag. Bag. And looking down into the future, I still plan to go into the documentary commercial style space. And I'm trying to pursue those commercial jobs more and get on set more and have a bigger crew and have assistance and everything. So I need a camera that can crush it now, but something that I can also grow with where I'm not going to outrun it in the next couple years. And this is where I think upgrading from the Sony FX3 would really help out. I really want internal raw. I really need internal ND filters. I still want to have good battery life. Often these cinema cameras run off of bigger internal batteries. So that's a pretty good bonus. I still need cheap media. I don't really want to invest heavy into the CF cards. Having SD is a pretty nice option because all the other cameras I have shoot off of SD. The codecs out of the FX3 are great, but they're just not as clean as stuff on the FX6 or C70 or even the Pocket 6K. Having stuff that's lightly compressed is a lot nicer for me, even though it takes up more space. It's just nicer to have for these kind of shoots. And I also want a bigger camera that has a little bit more weight and heft to it to make it a lot easier for handheld shooting. The FX3 is so small and light and easy to work with, but that pro becomes a con when you start introducing micro jitters. So having a bigger camera that naturally just has that weight to it. Physics wise, will make handheld shooting look a lot nicer because there's less micro jitters. And for me, the main thing is workflow and image quality. If it has great dynamic range, raw capabilities, internal ND, 
and it's just easy and nice to work with, I'm absolutely sold on it. And honestly, client perception's a very big thing too. When you show up to set and you have a small little mirrorless camera, it's kind of hard to get taken seriously. But when you show up with a big rig, it's rigged out with all these things attached to it, especially with a big seven inch monitor, everyone just kind of drools over it. So it's ultimately just vanity and it doesn't mean anything because you can roll in with a red Komodo or a C300 or a C500 and not know how to expose or frame up a shot. So it doesn't really equal talent, but having a nice camera definitely looks good in the client eyes and it kind of makes it look like they're spending their money wisely and like they're getting their money's worth. So it's all kind of BS, but it kind of is what it is. So why then would I upgrade from the Sony FX3? I've been using the FX3 for a little over a year now. And ever since renting it for my trip to Montana, I've been in love with this camera. It's been a fantastic camera for YouTube, for travel stuff, for personal work, as well as my client work that's been growing this past year. And why would I want to upgrade from a camera that I've been so stoked and happy with and something that's been doing pretty well with the kind of jobs I've been throwing at it. And it brings up the questions, is this camera camera not good anymore? Is the image quality not nice? Is there anything that it's lacking with? I can say no to all those things because when you buy into this camera, you know that it's missing a couple different features. And I wanted to upgrade not based off of lack, but based off of where I was in my career and where I'm going. At the end of the day, cameras are tools and they're going to do their intended job really well. And some are built for certain scenarios better than others. And for the FX3, it was always meant to be a B camera for me. The main bonus of the FX3 was that it could actually crush it for all my client work. I knew it didn't have internal ND, so I was planning on getting a camera down the road that had it. But with the FX3, I was fine for a year using fixed NDs, but it doesn't have the workflow of internal ND because you still have to swap filters, and when you're using primes, you have to swap them off each lens and it kind of gets old. And essentially I'm a cinematographer and that's the path I want to go down. I'm not a hobbyist, I'm not a prosumer. I'm a cinematographer and I do that as my profession. So I want to work with proper cinema tools. If you're a pro photographer, you're not going to choose an iPhone over a Canon R5 if you're using that for client work. For personal work, you might. You might want to carry around a Fuji X100V that's not as nice as your main client camera. And it's the same thing with video. Just because these mirrorless cameras shoot video and they're viable for a lot of people doesn't mean that they're gonna be a fantastic, reliable tool for client work. And I think that's where these cameras are kind of tiered off. Having a camera like the C70 or FX6 or Komodo, you could build with it and it's kind of built more for working on sets. You have the robustness of the camera build. They're often a little bit bigger. They have different features and exposure tools and better codecs and all around they're just a more professional tool. And there's nothing wrong with that. There's no knock against these hybrid mirrorless cameras, but that's just kind of the nature of it when you're going down a path like this. And there's a reason why they have these cameras in these different segments. If the FX3 was the do-it-all camera, they wouldn't have an FX6, FX9, or Venice. So you really have to look in and see what you're doing and the workflows that you're in to see what camera will benefit you better. Just because a camera is incredible and great, it might not be good for your workflow. But because of the budget and the price of the FX3, I was willing to eat that compromise of not having internal ND. It worked fine for a year, but now I'm just getting to the point where it's honestly getting old and I don't want to go back to VND. The image quality is not as good. So essentially the next camera I need to get has to have internal ND. Internal RAW is going to be a great option for commercial shoots where I need a nice 12 bit codec and I need it to be nice and sharp and have all this flexibility and latitude in post. 10 bit codecs are still amazing for that, but having RAW is just a nice little bonus. Then having a camera that's a little bit bigger for handheld shooting, just makes it a lot easier to rig up a Teradek, a monitor, easy rig, V-mount. It'll make that setup for commercial shoots a lot nicer than the FX3. But yeah, as this year went on and I've started to book more and more shoots and started to see the quality of jobs get better, I felt like it was due time to get an upgrade to go alongside my FX3. So I have a bunch of criteria for my new A camera. It needs to check off all these different boxes to make sure that it's gonna be a good fit for me and it's gonna be a good fit for later on down the road. I primarily only shoot with one camera. I never really do multi-camera stuff. So essentially the world's my oyster. I just need versatility. It needs to work in a variety of different scenarios and job types and environments. I need it to be flexible and comfortable when it's rigged up for productions and also stripped down for run and gun shoots when I'm out in the mountains or out in the desert or wherever. I also need internal ND, 10 bit codecs at the minimum, internal raw would be nice. Autofocus would be great. Having audio built into the camera is amazing as well. Great battery life, exposure tools. At the end of the day, I want a workhorse camera, something that's reliable and robust and something that I know that's going to work. I don't want to show up to set and have to worry about something not working with this new camera. And ultimately, I just want something that's going to make my workflow even better and even quicker and even smoother. And after these last couple years of researching, I finally dialed in on the segment of cameras that I'm looking into. And it's around the 6K mark for the body. And then a full kit would be around like seven to 10K. And those three cameras are all incredible and they're extremely popular. It's the Sony FX6, Red Komodo, 
in Canon C70. So first off, the camera that basically made me switch to Sony, the Sony FX6. This camera has it all, full frame, SDI, 10-bit 422, great battery life, internal audio, internal ND, better yet, internal EVND. It has auto ND that adjusts to the scene and the exposure. It's pretty insane how that works. It has solid media options. You can use CFE or SD card in both slots. It has a side handle and a top handle that have start stops and zoom rockers and customizable buttons everywhere. And it has a great monitor that you can attach and it's comfortable rigged up as well as stripped down. It's definitely a workhorse camera. And on paper, it's the best camera to accompany alongside the FX3, especially with the new firmware V2 update for the FX3. And for the longest time, the FX6 was my dream camera to work alongside the FX3 up until I started working with it. I rented it for a shoot for Baby Leto and it was amazing to work with. It was so nice to have a cinema camera with internal ND and SDI because I was able to run a Teradek through it and I was working with Leica R Prime so swapping lenses was really easy and really quick. But after working with this camera a handful of times I started to notice how big this camera actually is. Standalone the body is really small and really light. I think it's smaller than the C70 but it kind of got annoying to work with once you started adding the bare sun to it, which wasn't really a good sign. When you have the side handle, top handle, and the monitor attachment on it, it has this like weird Franken rig kind of feel to it where the monitor is out to the side and the side handle and top handle make it a little bit wider and taller. And I tested it out because I wanted to see how this camera would fit in a backpack. And I threw it all in there and it took up the entire compartment, which I definitely cannot have. The body was fine, but you need the top handle if you want to have internal audio, which is kind of annoying. The body doesn't even have a 3.5 port on it, which is pretty lame, but you definitely need a top handle with cinema cameras. So you kind of have to take that and then you need to put the monitor on it, which the monitor is great, but it definitely adds like some extra length and extra space in your bag. And then the side handle is kind of a essential too because you have the start stop on it and it's just comfier to hold the camera. So having all these things take up the main compartment in my bag was a huge no-go. I need to be able to throw lenses in there and other accessories and lights and media and batteries and my Fuji and everything else. And if I were to bring that on a trip, my bag would be pretty packed full and it wouldn't really be the best workflow for me because I need everything in that main compartment and then all my chargers and other stuff in the top compartment. So it's really weird to see how big this camera was. And it was kind Kind of a bummer because on paper everything looked like it was good to go but because of that workflow with the camera I just knew that it wouldn't be as ideal for me because I wanted something that was small enough to throw in a backpack and I could also build it out. But having something small is kind of hard to do when the camera itself isn't small. I really enjoyed working with this camera and the codec was significantly cleaner than the FX3, but it didn't have internal RAW, which is fine. I guess you don't really need RAW, but it'd be a nice option. And then the other downside of the Sony FX6 was that it was back ordered for like two years. It got announced, people got their hands on it, and then it was like impossible to get unless you wanted to pay $8,000 for a $6,000 body. So it's kind of annoying that Sony couldn't keep up with that or whatever happened with it. There were other cameras in the market that were still staying in stock besides the FX6. So I'm not really sure what happened there. But it's funny because I was so dead set on the FX6 when I switched over to Sony because in my head, I thought it was gonna be the best camera for me. But don't get me wrong, this camera is still amazing and you can make a lot of great work with it. But it just felt a little too ENG for me. I wanted something that would be a little bit more robust and kind of customizable to run on commercial shoots. It just felt like it was like a TV broadcast camera. And like for running around the mountains, it just felt like I was gonna like break something potentially. It just didn't really feel like as small and compact as my Sony FX3. And then the other thing that's kind of like not really a downside is that it's kind of the same sensor as the FX3. I don't think there's anywhere online that says that it's not. I think it's just like the different codec compressions that kind of differentiate these two cameras. But if you want that sensor, you can get the full frame Sony sensor in the FX3 or A7S3. So there's really no bonus to get the FX6 besides having internal ND, SDI, and a less compressed 10-bit codec. So after analyzing all of that, I decided to give up on my Sony FX6 dreams and to move on to something else. And then I moved on to researching everyone's dream camera, the Red Komodo. And I spent so much time looking at this camera because it was really enticing. And there's this like kind of mysteriousness and aura around the Red Komodo because for every filmmaker, owning a Red is kind of the goal. But I didn't want to let that get in the way of actually looking at it with clear eyes and seeing if the Red Komodo would actually be a great addition to my kit and make my workflow a lot nicer. And I've never really bought into the Red hype because they were often way too expensive for kind of what they were. I see a lot of people rocking the Red Geminis and 
heliums and everything and they have these insane camera builds but the media is like a thousand dollars for 500 gigs which is kind of absurd and you have this massive camera and it didn't really make sense for me but when the red komodo came out it was enticing because you get the red r3d raw with a 6k sensor and the small little build for six thousand dollars and the komodo looked amazing it's a small little camera that could be built up for larger sets and really be customized for anywhere it doesn't really have the best screen so you definitely need a monitor the outrigger side handle from red looks like a great addition to have start stop as well as holding it. And the camera just looks like a fantastic option because that 16-bit R3D RAW is just so good to work with. You slap on a lot and it's pretty much good to go from there on out. And this camera is nice because you could have the BP batteries as well as a V mount and it uses CF cards so it's a lot cheaper than the Red Mags and it just looks like a much better option for a lot of filmmakers out there. But I didn't want to get caught up with the name and the image quality so I had to dive in even deeper. It was a real consideration for me because I see a lot of people rocking the Sony A7 line as well as the Red Komodo. So I thought it would be a great addition to my kit because I have the Sony FX3 for the run and gun stuff where I need autofocus and then I have the Komodo that I can do all my commercials on. But the more I looked into the Komodo, I realized it wasn't for me, at least right now. The main thing for me was internal ND. This camera doesn't have internal ND. If I wanted it, I can get the Revolva like spinning NDs or whatever, but that tacks on another couple thousand dollars. To get this camera up and running, you need a lot of accessories. You need a good V-mount kit and you probably need three to four V-mounts. If you're gonna go the BP route, you probably need four to six BP batteries. You need a ton of media because the 6K ROG gets you like 500 gigs for about like 60 minutes, depending on like what frame rate and like resolution you're at. That just wasn't viable for me in the long run. I don't have the budget to be able to throw thousands of dollars into media as well as beefing up my storage at home. And I don't want to shoot in ProRes because you get this camera, you want to shoot it in R3D RAW. But I did love the flexibility with this camera and how it's an industry standard. A lot of people are using these on actual commercials and productions, which is pretty cool to see. And being able to run it small with just a side handle and a couple BP batteries and a lens looks like a really great kit for run and gun stuff where you're out traveling. But it's definitely missing a couple things. There's no internal ND, there's no internal audio options, there's a 3.5 port but it's not really as robust as like an XLR port and then there's no autofocus I mean it has like the single point autofocus but it's not as reliable as like Canon or Sony but you buy this camera based off of knowing that you're gonna be pulling focus you might have a first AC and you're not really worried about audio because there's a sound guy on set so it's definitely a more production focused camera where you have a larger crew but for me that's not what I'm doing everything I'm doing I'm solo I need to run audio by myself I'm pulling focus by myself I don't have budget for all this media and all these batteries so I need something that can run pretty minimally. And the main thing that I've seen with the Komodo too is that the SDI port gets fried pretty easily. And I know there's precautions and a workflow for pulling power and plugging in the SDI and stuff, but having a $6,000 camera where you can easily ruin it like that is not enticing for me at all. But this Komodo was definitely interesting because of all the commercial work I've been doing, I could have seen this Komodo working really well for the New Balance shoot, the Shandon shoot, Baby Leto, all these different things where I'm mostly just focused on producing a really great image and I'm running around and it would have been really fun, but at the end of the day, I still have to use ND filters on the outside of my lenses and it's just, I don't wanna have that workflow again. Once you start working with internal ND, you never want to go back to something that doesn't have it. But maybe down the road, the Komodo will be a great fit for me if I'm doing more production stuff where there's actually budget to have media and hard drives taken care of and I have a first and second AC to help with lens swaps and pulling focus and all that. But for now, that's just not it. So I had to say goodbye to the Komodo as well. And now onto the Canon C70. And if you were just skipping around this video and you weren't really watching it all the way through, spoiler alert, I bought the C70. And it's really interesting looking back on these last couple years on my perspective of all these different cameras I was looking at. Back when I was buying a camera for myself coming from the C70 and the Pocket 6K, for me, I thought the FX3 and the FX6 were gonna be the best for me. And I still think I could use the FX6 in a lot of different scenarios. I just think the C70 is better suited for my workflow over the FX6. The C70 has everything for me. I feel like it's a combination of the FX6, FX3, and the Komodo. It's small and portable and can fit in my backpack and the minimum kit doesn't really take up that much room. It could be built up for larger productions to have a monitor, V-mount, rails, and tear deck and all that. It has built-in audio, internal ND, internal RAW, great 10-bit codecs, great battery life, SD cards, great file sizes, and a lot of solid cinema functions. You have time code and you have a bunch of buttons to customize it with, and you have false color and waveform. It pretty much has it all. Only weird thing about it is the flip screen. I am a little 
tiny bit nervous about it because a lot of people have had issues with it. But thankfully Canon Costa Mesa is like 10, 15 minutes away. So I can just throw it over there and in like three or four days I'll have the camera fixed. But for now, I'm hoping that they like did some fixes to it so it won't be an issue. And another thing that sold me on the C70 over the FX6 was that the audio was built into the body. I didn't need this top handle to be attached to the camera to actually have access to my audio, which makes it bulkier because that handles bulkier or whatever. But the C70 has too many XLR ports and a 3.5 port on the side of the body. So even if I ditch the top handle, I still have access to audio. So having the audio built into the camera just makes the kit a whole lot smaller and honestly a whole lot nicer. This camera also has insane autofocus and great lens options and the DGO sensor is phenomenal. You get 16 plus stops at dynamic range and the image quality is just absurdly good. And like I said before, this sensor comes from the C300 Mark III, which is a $10,000 camera. And the great thing about the C70 versus that is that the C70 has an RF mount, which means you can adapt literally everything to it. Whereas the C300 has an EF mount where you can't really adapt that many lenses to it. And both cameras are Super 35, which is fine. The Komodo Super 35, the FX6 is full frame, but the nice thing about the C70 is that you have flexibility with it. With Super 35 with an RF mount, you can use so many different lenses. You can adapt vintage lenses, old EF lenses. You can use a speed booster if you wanna use full frame glass or medium format glass. You can also use Super 35 glass too, which I couldn't on the FX6 or FX3 unless I use the crop mode, which I don't know why you'd use a crop mode on that anyways. So at the end of the day, the Super 35 sensor isn't really a downgrade, especially because of the dynamic range and image you're getting out of it. With the C70, it's so nice to have the option to run the normal adapter or the focal reducer with my vintage lenses. If I wanna have just a normal field of view, like a full frame field of view with these lenses, I can. The great thing about that is I also get an extra stop of light. I've been loving using the focal reducer with it. It feels like it's like the FX3, but not as wide, I guess, but it's been pretty great so far. In my mind, I knew I needed the C70. I wanted the Komodo because of the red name and the codec and all that. But I knew that I would get it and I would still be unhappy with the workflow because I need a run and gun centered camera. The Komodo is kind of like the Pocket 6K where you need to rig it up, which is no fault to its own. That's the kind of camera that you're getting with it. I knew I needed something like the C70 or FX6 and it ultimately came down to the C70 and it's the perfect camera for me. So you may be thinking, wouldn't the FX6 be the better move because it would match perfectly with the FX3? I definitely agree with that because the FX3 and FX6 share the same base ISO sensitivities, same gamma curve, basically the same sensor, or just kind of different codecs. On paper, yes, it would make the most sense as an FX3 owner to buy an FX6 to then use them together and to have them synonymous with each other. Of course, everyone thinks if you buy into a camera, with that certain lens system, you have to buy cameras with that system from there on out. Thankfully, I'm not too heavily involved with any lens systems that I've been a part of. I never really bought into the EF lens system, didn't really buy into the Sony E. I just have my 20 mil and the Sigma 2470, but I primarily just have a kit of vintage stills lenses that don't have autofocus, so I don't have to worry about like smart adapters and them working with other cameras because they're manual on every camera and they're EF, so I can adapt them to any camera that I get. And that same thought about the FX6 and FX3 can be thrown over to the people who have the A7S threes and Komodos. It makes complete sense why someone would own both those cameras. Those cameras are great in two different realms. So how is this any different with the C70 and the Komodo versus the FX3 and A7S III? No doubt the FX6 is a great camera for a lot of people, I just felt like the C70 was better for my needs. I personally try to be brand agnostic. I'm not trying to fanboy all these different camera brands and be solely bought into them. I wanna use the camera that's gonna give me the best workflow for my money. If I'm gonna buy into a camera and it's not gonna make life easier or make the product better, it's pointless. So I saw that the FX6 wasn't gonna be the best option for me. So there's no point to spend 6,000 plus dollars on a camera that I'm not gonna be extremely happy with. I give praise and credit where it's due, but at the end of the day, these cameras are tools. I got a job to do and I wanna have fun with these cameras. And the C70 is it. It's the tool I wanna to use for my work. The FX3 is a tool I'm gonna to use for my work. And I wanna work with the camera that's gonna make the process smoother and quicker and easier and actually produce a good image. So I still plan on using both these cameras just in different scenarios. Now I have two insane cameras that can fit a variety of different projects in their own different realms. For the FX3, I still plan on using it for YouTube and travel. And now I have a camera to actually film myself and have a C70 to film what I'm filming. So I can do a lot more YouTube stuff with this. I work alongside my buddy Connor who shoots primarily on Sony. So I'd be kind of an idiot for selling my FX3 when I work with him a bunch because he shoots on the A7S III. He's also planning on getting the Komodo soon. So the C70 pairs well with that. I don't really do multi-camera stuff. So I'm not worried about matching these cameras together. I primarily show up with one camera and that camera is going to be the main one to do the 
job. If I'm working with other people, we try to match our cameras together, of course, but now I have two options. I can get hired out as a Canon shooter or as a Sony shooter, or I mean, if they're gonna rent a camera or provide a camera, that's like a whole different conversation too. The C70 is now gonna be my main client facing camera anytime I'm doing any kind of commercial shoot or documentary or social media stuff. The C70 is gonna be the first instinctual choice because of the raw codec, internal ND, in the battery life and just the workflow with it, as well as the client perception. But the FX3 will definitely be the main choice if I'm doing like a travel shoot, like overseas or like flying somewhere. And if they're shooting on Sony, perfect. Or if I know I'm gonna be in low light settings, the 12,800 base sensitivity is pretty great to have too. It just all really depends and there's so much nuance with it. And it just really comes down to what's the job, what's gonna be the best fit, and I'm going with that option. At the end of the day, I'm using my contact Zeiss lenses pretty much anyways. So it makes it easy to use both these camera systems because they both can take on these EF lenses. So yeah, the C70 is it. It's the camera that I went with and the FX3 is still here. I'm not selling it off. I'm not getting rid of it. I plan on keeping it and I'm really excited to use it for YouTube stuff because I want to bring it out into the field and actually be able to show you guys what I'm doing and talk to the camera while I'm out there. So it's a great YouTube setup. This camera is still phenomenal. I know a lot of people are still using it as their A camera. Please don't sell off this camera and upgrade to the C70 because of me. That was just my decision. And I hope this video can help you guys out in your research, just taking the ideas that I thought of, my process with it, and adjusting it to your needs because everyone else has their different needs for the projects that they're doing, things that are important to them. Some people don't care about audio, some people do, internal ND, not, the list goes on. So don't upgrade to the C70 because of me, don't sell off your FX3 because of me, I'm still using it, it's still an insane camera. And for the price to performance, the FX3 is fantastic. I still have to make my FX3 review coming up soon and have a lot of good things to say. So when I announced that I bought the Canon C70, it brought up a lot of questions. So I figured I might as well ask on Instagram and Twitter and all that, send me your questions. I want to see what you guys are thinking about. Maybe that's something that I missed in this entire video video that you guys thought of and you guys sent in a lot of great questions. So starting off, is the C70 autofocus really that bad? No. It struggles in low light and in dark situations, which any camera is going to struggle in those scenarios anyways. Even my FX3 struggles in low light. So I can't really fault it for that. At first it didn't have the face tracking and stuff. So it wasn't as good as like say the R5 or the FX3, but with that new update coming out with the face tracking, it's going to be really good. So you can't really expect a camera to be insanely perfect in all scenarios. And that goes for any camera, not just the C70. So when I did all this stuff with Sam, we were using the RF 15 to 35 and the 24 to 70, which those were amazing amazing lenses. And we wanted to use RF glass because the autofocus was reliable and they had stabilization built in. So for us, the autofocus was perfect because it did the job. Like we weren't really expecting it to do stuff that it wasn't going to do. But in the low light settings, I would just manual focus. And yeah, I think if you practice manual focusing, you'll be able to take over in those scenarios and be fine. But the autofocus on the C70 is good enough for sure. Next question is, how have ND filters changed my workflow? Well, ND filters being built into the body just makes it a lot quicker just by the nature of it. You now have zero to 10 stops inside the camera and you can change them with just a click of a button. Whereas with these other cameras, you have these circular filters like this that I need to throw on the lens and then take that off when it's time to change exposure or change lenses. And when you're working with primes, it gets really annoying, especially these contacts primes. I love working at them. The image quality is so worth it. But oftentimes when I'm working with the FX3 doing run and gun stuff, taking that time out to swap lenses and to swap filters just kind of gets old. I was fine for pretty much my entire filmmaking career without internal ND, but once I got that first taste of it, it ruined everything else for me. This last year with the FX3, I've been fine without it. No doubt I've been good with these Nisi IRNDs because they're really good. It's just the workflow of it. It's just so much faster just being able to be in a setting where it's dark and then go into one that's light and swap filters just by pressing a button. It's just like such a nice luxury to have with cameras like this and I wish the FX3 had it. I would definitely sacrifice IBIS for internal ND, but it would make the camera bigger. So it's kind of the trade-off of it. I'd rather, I guess, have the size of the FX3 without internal ND. Will I rig out the Canon C70? Yes, I will. In fact, I already did. I have the bright tangerine cage on here, balled out on this because of the build quality and just the support of it. It attaches at the bottom, the side, and the top, so there's no wiggle at all. I've heard the tilt and small rig cages kind of start to drift when you only have like one point of contact and with an expensive camera like this and knowing that I'm going to rig it up and have it on an easy rig and stuff, I knew it'd be dumb to get 
Tilta or small rig for it, which I love my Tilta and small rig cages for the Pocket 6K and the FX3. Just for this one, I want to treat it more professionally and went with Bright Tangerine. And I can tell you this thing is worth it. The NATO top handle is so clutch. There's so many different mounting points. I could put my receivers on here and transmitters and everything. It's gonna be a really solid build to work off of. And even just having this plus a top handle is a great starting point to build off of as well. So yeah, the C70, I don't really plan on having it built up all the time, just on certain shoots, I'll have it built up. And then when I do the running gun stuff, I'll probably take the cage off and just run it with the stock top handle, which I don't really mind either. Will I adapt my Sony lenses or will I buy Canon lenses? Obviously contacts. So I'm pretty sure you can't adapt Sony lenses to EF or E. There's like this flange distance thing going on with it. I plan on using all my contacts lenses cause they're EF and I have the EF focal reducer and the normal EF adapter. If I just want to use the super 35 sensor without adding in more light and like adding more field of view to my lenses, I have options with that. For now, I primarily use the contacts lenses with my Sony anyways. It's going to be the same with the C70. I just love these primes. They're so good. Good. They're way more affordable. They're light and they're just so fun to work with. I may add RF lenses in the future. We'll definitely see how all that goes down. The RF 2470 was an absolute workhorse for me when working with Sam. So I might add one of those in the near future as well, just for the shoots where I actually need autofocus. So I don't plan on getting an EF lens and adapting it for autofocus. I don't really mess around with that. I want the native mount, no adapter, if I'm gonna rely on it for autofocus. So for now, I've just been using the context lenses and I'm loving it. Next question is, what's my approach for focusing manual focus lenses on running gun shoots? So the main thing I always do is having peaking on a monitor, whether it's a five inch or seven inch monitor or the built-in LCD screen. I'm always having peaking on there to make sure that I know what's in focus. It's definitely nicer having a bigger seven or five inch monitor. Sometimes it's not that viable if you wanna have a smaller kit. So I always try to make sure I have that. The great thing about manual focusing is that if you miss focus, it looks better than when autofocus messes up. Cause when autofocus messes up, it like does this little thing and jitters around and hunts. It looks disgusting. But the nice thing about manual focusing is that you can finesse it and even still like it doesn't look as drastic as autofocus. But with these manual focus lenses, I always try to look at the screen, look at what's in focus with peaking and then base it off of distance. So when I'm filming, I'm thinking, okay, they're going farther away. So I start to focus and throw the focus towards infinity and vice versa for when they're coming closer. So I'm always trying to read it's definitely a dance. We'll definitely do a video on that later on in the future. Jordan Schultz said, happy you've seen the truth. Happy to be back. Freaking love this camera. Another question is, are they easy to match? I will definitely have to experiment with this. I don't think they'll be that difficult to match. I've already done a couple tests with them and surprisingly, the FX3 is dangerously close. There's definitely more dynamic range, especially when you see the highlight roll off in the shadows on the C70. It's kind of the nature of the camera and the sensor, but it really made me really impressed with the FX3. And even coming from the C70 to the FX3 and then back on the C70, the FX3 can freaking hold its own. That 10 bit 422 codec with the full frame sensor paired with vintage glass, it just looks so good. So I'm not too worried about matching these cameras. I'll primarily be using them separately, but if I have to use them together, I'm sure I'll be able to make them match. If I do, I'll definitely make a conversion LUT for them. Which camera produces the best quality, dynamic range, sharpness, etc. between the FX3 and C70? I think definitely the C70, but like I said, the FX3 can definitely hold its own. The FX3 is definitely sharper, but I think the C70 has a more pleasing filmic organic look to it, kind of like an Airy Alexa. The FX3 I think looks the best in the whole prosumer mirrorless hybrid market for sure. C70 versus Pocket 6K. Of course, the Pocket 6K has no internal ND, but it has 6K RAW. They both have a Super 35 sensor. Pocket 6K, you definitely need a monitor because that back screen monitor isn't bright and it's kind of hard to see when you're like holding it down low or to the side or whatever. Pocket 6K's battery life is terrible. Autofocus is trash. The image is great though. The image is definitely amazing, but I think the workflow kind of hinders it. The C70 is definitely more of a run and gun workhorse camera. I think it does what the Pocket 6K does, but a whole lot better. And it has like a good blend of like run and gun and cinema. So definitely C70. So what's the biggest selling point of the C70? I think it's the DGO sensor, the dynamic range, internal ND, the size of the build, having audio built into the side of the body. The RF lenses are fantastic. I like those more than the Sony lenses. The battery life's great. The raw codec, the 10 bit codecs, but I think the one biggest selling point of the C70 is the sensor. Yeah, by far. The DGO sensor is insane. So what was the final factor that made me pull the trigger on the C70? I think it's all the shoots I've been getting and the ones that are to come. All the small commercial jobs that are run and gun where having internal ND would just be insanely nice to have. Internal ND is 
I can't stress it enough. It's so convenient. The speed is so nice, especially when working with primes. I really wanted that. I really wanted that DGO sensor out of the C70. I love the image quality of the FX3, but I just feel like it wasn't as high as it could be, like the Komodo FX6 or C70. So I was definitely ready to level up in that sense, especially with all the shoots I've been getting and the ones that are coming up. And at the end of the day, my plan all along was to have an FX3 and something to be my A camera. So I definitely thought it was time to upgrade the camera for sure. Someone asks, what about the R5C? Well, the R5C was something that I was told to wait for when I was looking into the FX3, and I'm glad I didn't wait for it because it's not everything that I wanted it to be for a B camera. It's really close in price to the C70, which makes it hard for me to like commit to it. It's like $4,500 or something. Of course you have 8K raw, 6K raw and all that. I don't really care about resolution. I just want dynamic range and great image quality and a great workflow. And the R5C, I know it runs hot. The battery life is really bad on it. And having a big chunky camera like that, that doesn't have internal ND or C-Log2, I think, it just wasn't really the best option for me. If I'm gonna get a B camera to the C70 to match it, I'll probably get an R5 or an R6. And then the last question, what monitor will I be using? Currently I have the small HD 702 touch, which is the best monitor I've ever used. The image quality of it is great. It's super sharp, it's color accurate. It's insanely bright, it's just a little heavy, but you can also power it through V-mount through the barrel port and then run your LP batteries or MPF batteries off the back. You can do a lot with this monitor. It also has SDI and HDMI, so you can use it with a variety of different camera setups and run a Teradek out of it to send wireless video through the feed. So it's a really flexible monitor and it's well worth it because you can actually see what your stuff's gonna look like and the user experience of it is so fluid. It's way better than the Atomos monitors. I highly recommend it. And since I bought it, Small HD has released new smart monitors, mostly their five inch monitors. So the Cine 5, Indy 5, and the Ultra 5. I think the Cine 5 will definitely be a good addition to this kit because seven inch is kind of a little too big sometimes with a kit like this. Sometimes when I'm on set, having a seven inch monitor is nice because I could see everything. But when I'm out in the field, having a little less weight and a little less footprint in a five inch monitor would be more ideal. So that's the kit that I have right now. And and it's been working out pretty good. So yeah, I hope you guys enjoyed this video. I hope this was helpful in your researching with these different cameras, and I hope this brought some clarity into why myself as a Sony owner bought a Canon camera. And maybe you see the reasons why, maybe you don't agree with me. But if you have any further questions about the C70 or the FX3 or any future plans or literally anything, leave them down below, send me a DM. I'll definitely answer you and I'd love to have a conversation about that. If you enjoyed this video, please leave a like. And if you haven't subscribed, please consider it. So yeah, with all of that, I'm super stoked on the C70. It's been a great addition so far. And I'm really excited to start putting it to work. See you guys. Cheers.